All right, good morning. Um, this morning we are talking about musculoskeletal disorders uh, with an internal medicine spin. So I don't really want to talk about osteoarthritis or patella luxation, if that's all right with everybody, <laughs> or really hip dysplasia either. <laughs> um, obviously, they're considerations, and you guys, um, most of you are working in GP land, and if you're presented with a dog with shifting lameness, um, obviously, um, orthopedic conditions should be considerations, uh, but we don't really need to talk about them because there's not much to talk about. Um, so why don't we start with, would it, uh, first of all, does anybody have any cases that they specifically want to discuss that um, sort of interesting diagnoses or interesting presentations that ended up being a um, skeletal or musculoskeletal disease? Not really? No. It's interesting because you read about this stuff in the textbook and like Edinger has like a paragraph on certain disorders and you sort of think, oh, I'm never going to see that. And some of them are actually quite common. Like it doesn't, they didn't go into a huge amount of detail on hypertrophic osteodystrophy. Is that what it's called? HOD? Yep. Yep. <laughs> uh -huh. <laughs> Always get the osteopathy and the osteodystrophy wrong. Um, but that's actually something I've seen quite commonly. Um, I don't know whether that's just Australian genetics or um, or what, but it's not an uncommon disease and it's probably underrepresented in the literature. Um, and I think because in, in internal medicine, I see a lot of referrals for pyrexia of unknown origin. We see a lot of patients who have like a bit of myalgia associated with a pyrexia. And you sort of palpate their muscles and go, oh, they're sore, could be a myositis, they've got a borderline CK, um, or their joints might be a little bit sore associated with their kind of pyrexia as well. So you sort of do a spinal palpation and go, uh, a little bit sore maybe, and it can be a little bit hard to identify. So um, quite a few of the disorders that I want to cover today present as a pyrexia of unknown origin with poorly localizable pain. Um, so if we sort of say I've got a 18 week old Kelpie who presents with a reluctance to eat, no vomiting or diarrhea or other gastrointestinal signs, and on physical examination has um, a stilted, short strided gait and a pyrexia of 39.8. What specific things will you do in your physical exam to investigate that further? Palpate long bones. Good. Good. There. Also just palpation elsewhere. So neck, neck spinal mm -hmm. pain, joint, joint pain as well. Like all that, just trying to source where the pain is coming from, if it's a shifting lameness, but mm -hmm. long bones. Enjoy yeah. it. It's a kelpie, so you touch and it goes everywhere you touch it. <laughs> Makes it really easy. <laughs> Sorry? Makes it real easy. <laughs> real easy. <laughs> but it's realistic, isn't it? I find lameness or source of pain so hard to identify in young dogs in particular when they're a bit like wiggly and flighty. Um, so it's hard to identify where the pain is coming from, but it seems to be most profound pain response in the forelimbs and um, seems to be on palpation of the bone rather than flexion of the joints. What sort of diagnostics do you want to do next? Some radiographs would be good, I think, um, as well as some blood testing. Good. Excellent. Okay. What are we looking for in our radiographs? What sort of, I should say, what are your differentials? Could be a, a fracture, could be um, hypertrophic osteodystrophy, mm -hmm. could be a, um, could be arthritis, like an inflammatory arthritis that you may probably wouldn't see on radiographs. 
Yeah. Could be a, um, osteopenia if it's had a mal malnutrition. Good. Or no. Yeah. And osteitis. Good. Uh, it would immune mediated diseases be a consideration? Yeah, potentially, particularly myositis or something like that. Mm. It's they'd be very young to have like a primary immune mediated disease, but certainly immune mediated inflammatory disease, maybe secondary to another infection or something like that. Um, there's one more infectious disease. Good, thank you. Yeah. What sort of infectious diseases do we see that might cause shifting lameness? Ehrlichia canine may cause mm -hmm. um, signs of lameness. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And infections. Bone infections? Protoz oh, bone, no. Oh, no. Protozoal Most infections, good, yeah. Uh, particularly if the dog's been fed a raw meat diet. Good. Yeah, excellent. So which... Protozoa in particular for dogs? Uh, if it's been fed beef, it's probably going to be Neospora. Good. Yeah. It's a bit of that in Canberra, actually, because they're all made out of raw meat diets. Yeah, yeah. Cerebral often, too. And mm -hmm. uh, uh, Toxo if it's mutton. Ah, uh, yeah. Um, cats tend to get Toxo, dogs tend to get Neospora. So there's they sort of used to, or a, a lot of the old literature, um, the testing, there was cross-reactivity between Toxo and Neo. So they used to think that dogs got Toxo and theoretically they can, but it doesn't usually cause significant disease. Usually if they've got a myositis, it's Neo. Um, uh, so if they get a um, mycobacterium infection? Uh, good question. Just because recently I was speaking to a colleague from a different hospital and she was yeah. telling me that same presenting complaint is PUO, really yeah. young, like nine months. Um, and then in the end, it ended up having mycobacterial infection and also had um, HOD. Interesting. Where was the mycobacterial yeah. infection? GI or? No, it was actually, they found it as like a lump, like here. Yeah. And um, yeah, and then they also found one like in the chest area as well. Wow. And so they did like a like a FNA and cultured it and it was mycobacterium. Mm -hmm. And they also also found HOD and all the like department was really confused about yeah. you know the yeah. That's amazing. That's a cool case. Yeah. <laughs> um and that's a really good example of uh, essentially an autoimmune disease being secondary to an infectious disease um, so rather than sort of primary autoimmune um, so mycobacteria I'm I'm not sure about mycobacteria actually causing like osteomyelitis or a actual joint infection but certainly theoretically secondary polyarthritis anything that causes increased antibody reduction will potentially cause a polyarthropathy um so mycobacterial chronic infections like we see with mycobacterial infections could for sure so as far as kind of organisms we've got protozoa we've got mycobacteria let's go a bit broader on bacteria what other sort of infections might we see bacterial infections might we see that that could cause lameness i think that um campylobacteriosis it's sometimes dogs can develop that as a consequence of eating raw chicken or poultry. Yeah. I have a case that was seen by Jody at NBS and yeah. he ended up having Cushing's, but when they were trying to work out the case, she did suggest that uh, some dogs that eat raw chicken can develop um, musculoskeletal weakness from ingestion of raw chicken. Yeah. You know what the link is there? It's really interesting. So we're, I'm going to digress because it's not, not technically musculoskeletal. Um, it's um, associated with Coonhound paralysis, so polyradiculoneuritis. So it's actually inflammation of the nerve roots rather than the um, muscles or actually skeletal structures, but certainly weakness um, 
is the manifestation. So, and and certainly as that's developing, you might see a shifting kind of lameness or stilted gait. So put on the differential list for sure. Um, what I was thinking with bacterial infection is actually just osteomyelitis or um, infectious arthritis. Uh, because this is quite a young dog, theoretically, septicemia is more common in young dogs and they're quite tolerant of it um, and particularly introduced by the umbilicus. Um, so you can sometimes get bacteremia and seeding into joints, disc spaces, bones in young dogs. So I def definitely have that on the list. Um, and because people don't know their personalities yet, they don't know that they're quiet like or unwell you know so they can it can kind of fly under the radar a little bit and how often do you see a puppy come in with a slightly high temperature just because they've been in the car and you just go oh well yeah that's vaccinated i was trying to think of the term for that is it omphalitis yeah when it gets in through the um umbilicus i think so mm. yeah i think so um so osteomyelitis and then what other organisms can cause osteomyelitis, not bacteria? Um, yeah, fungal. Good. Yeah, exactly. What sort of fungal organisms cause bony, jointy infections? Um, I guess like aspergillosis mm -hmm. do that. Um, yeah. Things like disco. Mm -hmm. Asper will definitely cause an osteomyelitis too, um, potentially. Um, and there's two fungal organisms in the US. In fact, there's there's lots in the US that we don't really see here. Um, blastomycosis is one. Uh, typically, I think they present with pulmonary nodules and they get bone nodules too. So often you sort of do an X-ray and they've got chest nodules as well. You just double check that that's the right fungus. Yeah, blasto is pulmonary lesions and then Histoplasmosis is the other one. And that usually they have gut lesions and then that goes to bones as well. So there's sort of, I guess, the particularly in the US, there's justification. You know, you sort of see a PUO and you go, I'm going to do chest rads, I'm going to do ultrasound, I'm going to do rads of the joints. Like there's justifications for all these things because there's potential differentials that you might go, this is definitely histo because there's a gut lesion and a bone lesion. And I'm going to get a diagnosis by just doing this next test rather than doing these next tests. Does that make sense? Mm. Um, and then I guess the other fungal organisms, usually by direct, um, like inoculation. So you could have like a penetrating injury, particularly in the um, metacarpals or metatarsals or digits, like phal phal phalanges. <laughs> I love this topic. Uh, uh, and get fungal organisms introduced into the um, bones there. And I think cats get a spora, sporothrix or something from soil. Uh, so it's a consideration if it was a cat and not shifting lameness, but a one-digit swelling kind of thing. Um, so that covers most of the differentials, except for one that I read about and learnt, so I'm not going to like make you um, come up with it. Uh, but you can get IMPA associated with Toxicara and also um, heartworm, diaphalaria. Not really, particularly the diaphalaria is not really um, likely in such a young dog, although it's possible. Um, but Toxo potentially in a young dog, put that on the list. That's cool. Imagine getting, they've actually isolated larvae in the joints. Yeah, you. Uh, uh, good, excellent. So we've got a really good differential list. We've got a plan for our next diagnosis. So we're going to do bloods. So we're going to do um, some radiographs of the forelimbs. Um, I don't, osteomyelitis, like, I don't really want to talk about it too much because it's kind of just boring and infection in the bone, uncomplicated. Is that all right with everybody? Mm -hmm. <laughs> is it um, is it actually common like can't say i've ever seen like i've seen it due to trauma but um it's not i just think i would ever go looking for it 
I guess you would hopefully see it on radiographs, but mm. yeah. You know, yeah, I think it, um, I would say very uncommon. I've only seen it in relation to fungal, like systemic fungal yeah. infections. Um, so it, specifically German shepherds with aspergillosis and they've got uh-huh. it as well. Um, I can't say I've ever seen a bacterial that's not secondary to an intervention like TPLO or something like that. Anybody else? No, I'd agree with that. Yeah, very uncommon. I remember reading once somewhere that it was pretty rare, Mm. except in the circumstance that you just described. Yeah, exactly. Um, All right, so I'm going to share my screen, and this is not a test at all. Um, So I've labelled the slides with what we're going to be seeing. Gone. Might not be able to share with you. I feel like every time I try and get fancy, (laughs) stuff just disappears. I thought everyone would be at Science Week. Yes, it is a slightly smaller crowd than usual. Yeah, I, well, I'm covering for people on Science Week, but mm-hmm. I wish I was there. Yeah, me too. It's actually a good lineup, hey? Mm. Oh, yeah. Um, so I've stolen these images from papers and the internet. So where there's, um, I've referenced them, just which is why they're kind of labelled. It's hard. It was hard to make it a secret, but it was panosteitis and reference. Um, this is a clinician's brief paper um, on panosteitis. I love clinician's brief. They've got such a deep dive on like quite narrow topics in a very digestible um, format, and such good images. So say this little dog, we'd palpated and we've had a pain response along the forelimbs. Where does panosteitis typically um, localise to? What bones does it like? We'd have to say beyond the radius based on the Where they are, yeah. Probably. (laughs) It's like your long bones generally, isn't it? It's like the, oh, God, I can't remember, like the middle part of the bone, so the metaphysis or epiph- epiphysis or something like that. <laughs> Who knows their bones? Epiphysis. <laughs> Which one? The diaphysis. I think that's right. Diaphysis, the long bit. The long bit, yeah. 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 Um, so it likes long bones, exactly like you said, so actually humorous. Radius and ulna, most common, humerus first and then radius and ulna. And femur is um, kind of third on the list as far as um, how commonly the bones are affected. Um, In this image, the radius is actually normal, technically. In this one, you can see that there's, oh, somebody describe it to me. Is that the double facial line? Mm, no. no, okay. Not in this one. This is a young dog. You can see a physis here in the radius. Um, but the line here where all the sort of arrows are pointing at with panosteitis, what is the, what change do we see? Well, is it cortical thickening? Mm-hmm. Um, but there's changes in the medulla as well. Good. Yeah. What sort of changes? Radio opacity in the yeah. medulla it looks multifocal, mm-hmm. um, coalescing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, what is panosteitis? What happens? It's an increased increased inflammatory cells. Mm-hmm. And is that not? Yeah, I think it's just so increasing. 
Um, if you did histo, do you know what you'd find? What kind of cells or? Uh, yeah, cells and changes. So there's there's definitely inflammatory cells, but there's also a specific change that you're you've sort of described radiographically here. There's increased density in the bone, isn't there? And yep. somebody said in the medullary cavity. Mm -hmm. So we see ossification of the medullary cavity in panosteitis. So that's what you'd see radiographically, and then we see secondary inflammatory changes associated with that. Um, this is like this is growing pains is how it was described. This is what causes growing pains. I thought that was so interesting because I've got kids with growing pains. <laughs> um, so what sort of ages would we see panosteitis? When would it be on your radar? Would it be young then? Yeah, growing dogs. Yeah, exactly. So average presentation is not in the really fast phase of growth, but from sort of six months onwards. Um, and is it more so predisposed to like larger breeds versus small, like um, smaller breeds or not really? Yeah, yeah, it can can be any, but German Shepherds are much very overrepresented. Um. They can have kind of waxing and waning episodes over the course of their kind of growth and even up to two-ish years. But if you had a four-year-old dog present with bone pain, it wouldn't be high on my list. Um, do you know... Um, no, I don't have any more questions about panosteitis. <laughs> How do you treat it? That's a good question. Yeah, well, over the years, there are all sorts of ideas. As John Keeps said, if there's a lot of different treatments for something, either nothing works or spontaneous cures are common. Mm. Uh, and uh, I think it's now they've settled on non-steroidals, just pain relief. Yeah. Um, they used to say vitamin C, but I think that's... Um, been disproven hasn't it i don't know about vitamin c it wasn't in edinger but yeah they, essentially this is a self-limiting disease so it'll just go away of its own accord with some supportive care um, and the main thing is just managing the pain all right this is another one of panosteitis so this is probably more obvious isn't it that ossification like you can barely see the cortices in this image does everyone agree hmm. it looks like there's a little bit of um periosteal um new bone formation around the edge that fuzziness around the edge of that humerus as well um and what's this Um, is that a spicule or did it break off from normal bone? Um, this is so far outside of my comfort zone. But <laughs> it's an united and canal process. Um, so this dog's got a few reasons to be lame, I think, in summary. <laughs> German Shepherd, this one. Okay. So our little Kelpie, back to our case, 18-week-old Kelpie, uh, we do your radiographs and can you describe what you're, what you're seeing here? Yes. So Double physis and a case. It's um, so you get like two kind of lines, like one the kind of thicker um, radiopaque and one kind of radiolucent line. So, Ooh, um, sorry. <laughs> um, 
So I'm going to try and point to what you're um, uh, describing. So what is this line here? The prices. Good. What about this line here? Not FISIS. Not FISIS. Yeah. Right. So that's that's the double line that Josh was referring to. So that second kind of hypo, um, not hypoacobic, um, undense. <laughs> Radiolucent. That's the one. Thanks. <laughs> um, line is that sort of double FISIS line. Um, now that's a really pathognomonic change that we see with hypertrophic osteodystrophy in dogs. Uh, the double physeal line kind of thing. So you can see the physes and then you can see another one. This is quite an advanced case. And the other change I'll get Josh to describe. Mushrooming. Mushrooming. Yeah. It's really, again, really specific. Uh, when you get kind of collapse of this lytic area here, you get this um, new, new bone formation and mushrooming of the radius of the metathesis, I think it is. So met next to the physis. Make sense? What does mushrooming mean? Is it just like more bone on top? Yeah. Uh, so see how, can you see the mushroom shape? there so normally this would just be a like a really smooth line like that whereas we've got that kind of mushroom head on top of the the radius so that's why it's called mushrooming um but it is a combination of collapse of this region here so that the kind of long shaft of the bone is kind of squashed into the metaphysis a little bit and new bone formation at the metaphysis Can anybody tell me what's a classic presentation for hypertrophic osteodystrophy? How do they come in? Pyrexic, normally really painful. Mm -hmm. Like sometimes they don't even want to walk. Mm -hmm. How old are they? Really young. I think they're kind of more um, like less than six months. Mm -hmm. Same anyway. Mm -hmm. And what breed are they usually? One I, the ones I've seen is, was a German Shepherd and so they're kind of larger dog breeds again, I think. Mm -hmm. Is there one breed that's like classic? Weimaranas? Yes, good, absolutely. Yeah, so Weimaranas get this a lot, um, don't know why, but we've seen a lot of different breeds with this. So um, I've seen two Kelpies, which might yeah. just be a coincidence, but I think... A Kelpie and a German Shepherd. Yeah. I wonder whether we saw the same Kelpie. Maybe it was actually, yeah. <laughs> actually. yeah. Um, I've definitely managed a few because we sort of often do ultrasound part of what I do now doing ultrasounds. Um, I do the ultrasound in a pyrexia of unknown origin dog and say, oh, those those calf I saw. <laughs> Go and do a radio. Um, so I've seen a few sort of out and about, and they're that it can be any breed. Um the history in these guys is almost always that they've been vaccinated in the two weeks prior. Um, does anybody know what that association is? But that could there be no association in that um it's just the age that they present and they're getting vaccinations at the same time? It could as well. easily be, yeah, absolutely. But um, I think the again it kind of probably comes down to immune stimulation mm -hmm. as well so activating that immune response and um, probably getting inappropriate targeting of different tissues mm -hmm. yeah and we just certainly saw that with the mycobacteria case having mm. hod secondary to that um hod is actually reported in dogs with distemper oh mm. so they, there is a question about whether the antigen or like stimulation with a distemper vaccine might be associated with development of HOD, but that's not not clearly established yet. But it's a good theory. It's an interesting theory. Be cool. Mm. That would cause permanent issues for the dog, wouldn't it? 
the HOD? Yeah. Um, there's so much remodeling, you'd think yes. Like I would say, particularly if you've got some collapse of that radial length, then you're going to get some incongruity in the elbow potentially. But I have to say that most of the dogs that I've seen have made a full recovery and are pretty functional and normal afterwards. Well, that's good. Yeah. You probably wouldn't but, want to vaccinate your Weimarana if, um, if you weren't going to recover. No. No, exactly. No, they make a pretty good recovery. Pretty good prognosis. How do we treat it? Pred and or non-steroidals, I think, is the mm-hmm. current thoughts. Yeah. And realistically, there's not one that's better than the other. Um, so some dogs, are you always start them on non-steroidals and then if that doesn't give provide sufficient pain relief, just switch them over to Pred. Um, I feel like Pred has more side effects, particularly in these very young dogs on growth and metabolism and stuff um, than non-steroidals do. So that's the reason I do it that way. Um, but this paper that I've got referenced up here, the JSAP review, is excellent if anybody's interested in having a read. It's got really good images in it and um, the kind of stats on treatment response and stuff. It seems like PRED might be required in a lot of dogs, but most of them or some of them will get away with just non steroidals alone. Have you got, I'm sure we've read that one to, together, Josh. Did you just screenshot that? Did screenshot that. Um, yes. I can't remember if I have. <laughs> <laughs> this is so annoying. <laughs> I'm sure I've said this to all of you before, but I've got so many papers that I'm like, oh, I love this paper. This was so informative. I've never seen it. such a good review. And then I go to file it and I see three other copies that are all highlighted and like clearly been read and summarized. <laughs> that happens to me too. It's so sad. It's so annoying. Um, okay. So I want to change our case history a little bit now and talk about, Oh, there's so many things I want to talk about. Um, Considering the the topic, surprising. Okay, so I'm going to change the case history a little bit and say that we've got a um, six-month-old Westie with pyrexia and reluctance to eat but no specific lameness. Let's switch, switch sides Oops. to it. <laughs> Oops. Yeah. Can someone describe the radiographic findings here? Do you have like cortical thickening? Like a lot of it? A lot of it, yeah. It's Ex- way too much fucking here. But exostotic growth, so temporomand- around the temporomandibular, yeah. right? Yeah. So we've yeah. got definitely thickening of the <coughs> um, cort- cort- I was like, sorry, I'm glitching on cerebral cortex and bone cortex. <laughs> um, uh, so definitely thickening of the skull there. And then what about the mandibular here, the mandible here? It's so chunky, isn't it? And so dense when you look at what this kind of nasal bone, which is like a really dense bone, looks like relative to that, so thickened. And then the temporomandibular joint here is quite astoundingly thickened. So does anybody, has anybody ever seen craniomandibular osteopathy? No? I don't see any teeth there either. There's, there's some teeth. They're just in amongst, they're nowhere near as dense. So that's a canine there. And see how like canines are usually quite dense radiographically. See how lucent they are relative to that. Um, so this is one of those ones you read about in books and never see. Um, but I have had a case fairly recently, which was interesting. 
<laughs> so six month old bull mastiff presented with anorexia and um, pyrexia and had a palpably asymmetric skull. And the dog was actually quite dull and a little bit ataxic. And I thought, oh, something's going on. Like he's got some sort of like malformation or um, a trauma or something like that to the skull. And we sent him for CT and he had cranium antibiotic osteopathy. But he also had, but it was only the cranium. His mandible wasn't hypertrophic yet. Um, but he also had a bacterial um like extension of a middle ear infection into his brain. <laughs> Just very bad luck to have both of those things going on at the same time. Yeah. Um, but yeah, the, the presentation is typically quite subtle and it's not until you get changes in the jaw really that you'd find um, abnormalities on your physical examination, but they get quite like big and rounded through the jaw to palpate and their teeth get quite kind of pushed outwards you can sort of see that everything's kind of bulging under the teeth um so you can google some pictures of dogs with with um what their mouth looks like um do you have to treat this No. <laughs> Self-limiting. Similar to panosteitis. Wow. And that will just go away. So you just manage pain. Um, you have to treat the ones that have a concurrent bacterial meningitis. Um, so that's something that you'll probably never see, but it's on the list. So did you say that it goes away or the thickening is still there? or it goes that goes entirely away that's such a good question because you think that there's no way that's going away wouldn't you i don't know mm. Mm. and then that again like immune mediated immune mediated like just causing the thickening of like the cortices of here and here and here i knew this at some point sorry <laughs> <laughs> okay i've obviously like replaced that knowledge with something else irrelevant <laughs> Sorry. it's usually westies isn't it it's usually westies exactly yeah um more commonly westies or brachycephalic breeds um i might leave you guys to research this disease more <laughs> i have nothing more to add um okay i've gone backwards um accidentally but what about if we change our history again and say that the dog has predominantly shifting lameness in bilaterally in the hind limbs and it's a it's a one-year-old dog uh and it's also a westie just for fun what are our what's our approach going to be is it going to be similar diagnostics yeah, definitely physical exam you want to localise. Is it joints or long bones? Mm -hmm. um, check the gait and the neuro mm -hmm. function. Yeah. So we've got normal neurological exam. We've got pain in the hips bilaterally, left worse than right. And we don't have any pain in the hocks or muscles on palpation. Our bloods are all normal. Should we do a radiograph? Definitely. Yes. <laughs> um, so what are our differentials in the hind limbs? What, what, what would we add to our differential list from what we've already talked about? We add hip-related issues with that. So I guess like hip dysplasia or mm -hmm. um, I can't remember what it's called, or like the leg calf perths, the necrosis of the femoral head mm. in Good. there. Yeah. Sure. Who usually gets that? What breeds? Can't remember. Um, All breeds, like poodles, Yorkies, yeah. Chihuahuas. Yeah. The ones that will tell you, will scream at you and not let you localize their pain. Yeah. Those ones. Westies, actually, overrepresented as well. 
Um, what would you see radiographically? It's like a little like knobbly femoral head, I think. It's kind of like smaller than normal and yeah. Yeah. Probably would it be right. dense or lucent? Lucent. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Going to have less blood going to it, I guess. But yes, good, <laughs> exactly. So, um, this is straight off Google. Sorry, I haven't referenced this one, but you can see this is a dog that's got a normal left hip, and you can see there's um, irregularity of the density of the femoral head over here, knobbliness, as Josh said. And a loss of um, uh, size. What's that word? Atrophy. Necrosis. That's the word I'm looking for. Um, so often early on in disease, you'll just see a little bit of lucency at the um, femoral neck where the blood supply is kind of um, reduced early on in disease. And then later on in disease, as you start to get the necrosis of the femoral head, um, you'll see it looking like this. Excellent. Flipped fices. Big yeah. pardon? Flipped kappa two fices. Yes, that's a really good differential, actually. Yeah, especially in young dogs. Yeah. And yeah, trauma, exactly. Yeah, pelvic injury. The angle of the femoral neck in that dog was nearly ninety degree, ninety degrees. It was more, it was more straight than the other one was normal. Oh yeah. I don't. Oh, know. I see what you mean. Um, but you guys can't see what I mean. Hang on. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> oh, it's gone. Sorry. <laughs> You'll have to Google it yourselves. It was sticking straight in from the top of the face. It was straight in, wasn't it? Yeah. So we'd lost the bone. We'd lost the bone that creates that curve on the other side. Um, okay. So um, we now are going back to our Westie that's present, presented, one-year-old Westie that's presented with um, difficulty eating and pyrexia. And this time they actually had pain on palpation of these muscles and these muscles or these areas, yeah. What um, other differentials might we chuck on to our list other than cranium and nibula osteopathy, which is never going to happen? Masticatory muscle myositis. Great. This is Great. one that you'll actually see in your career. Has anyone seen it? You have? Yeah. You have it, Josh? Yeah. Wow. I've not been lucky yet. <laughs> <laughs> um, so this, this doesn't happen uncommonly. Um, what other head muscle myositis do we see? Autoimmune myositis. Um, would it be like a trigeminal thing, like could, a trigeminal neuritis? Could be. Trigeminal neuritis typical, typically causes atrophy and then fibrosis of those muscles. So you could definitely get mm. changes in ability to eat, but not so much pain. Mm. So as far as kind of when these dogs come into you, when they, at early on in the disease, would you expect the muscles to be atrophied or would you expect them to be normal or swollen? Probably swollen. Maybe swollen. Swollen, yeah. And because they're haired, you can't really see it. Like most people don't actually come in and say, my, my dog's forehead's swollen. Um, it's more on palpation that you can feel it just, it's sore and it's puffy. It feels abnormal. Um, so early on in the course of the disease, they're swollen. But then as the disease progresses, the muscles, the muscle cells die and they're replaced by fibrous tissue. So the muscles become quite atrophic and then it can be very difficult to tell the difference between a trigeminal abnormality 
and a masticatory myositis and an inflammatory myositis abnormality. Um, so there's another. Um, so I guess I'd have a more dis diffuse polymyositis on my list as well if I had pain here. So I wouldn't want to kind of just go, oh, it's going to be, I'm only going to test for 2M masticatory myositis. I want to do what specific blood test in my biochem profile do I want to be looking at? PK. <clears throat> PK. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, exactly right. And has anybody ever seen an inflammatory myositis on bloods? What, the C what sort of levels of CK you see? It's uh I think, high. I think I've seen it with protozoal disease. Yeah, very high. Yep. Yeah. Um, so we typically see CKs over a thousand, and these guys sometimes up to twenty thousand in inflammatory myositis. If it's confined to the head muscles, it's going to be lower just because there's not such di diffuse inflammation. Um, but if I see a kind of CK of ten thousand, I'm thinking we've got inflammation in more muscles than just these ones. And I need to be looking a little bit more broadly in, in terms of what might be causing that change in appetite. Sorry, I've just got to let my dog in urgently. Yeah. Um, uh, um, let's go back to masticatory myositis. What breeds are overrepresented? Does anyone know? Oi, I do. I'm going to say beagle because I've seen it in a beagle. Oh, yeah. I don't know about beagles, actually. <laughs> I think I saw one in the Sheba, but I'm not quite sure if they're represented. Did you say Sheba? Yeah. Sheba Inu? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I don't know if they're represented. There's so few that you, <laughs> I don't know how you'd establish that. Um, so all breeds any age, essentially. Um, Cavaliers have a particularly aggressive form that usually onset is between two and three months of age. They're really, really young. Um, so that's just a little pattern recognition thing that if a dog comes in super young I and mean, it's a cavi and pain around there, it's worth testing for the, how would you test, test for this? Um, 2M antibody. What are they? Um, yeah, I think they're antibodies towards muscle, particular part of the muscle fibers. Mm -hmm. Good. So there's particular part of the muscle fibers that are um, specific for masticatory muscles. So MM, masticatory muscle, 2M, um, myositis. So there's an antibody that only targets those muscles. Um, so autoimmune disease. And what's another way that we would diagnose it, which is more invasive? Biopsy. Yeah, biopsy, exactly. So you can see inflammation in the muscle and, and diagnose myositis that way. And that's true of any muscle. If you're concerned about um, a myositis and um, muscle biopsy is the diagnosis, basically. You can tell what type of um, inflammation it is, whether it's likely to be infectious or not. Um, it's something that we, I mean, we don't see inflammatory myositis very often, but um, we probably should do more biopsies. Um, okay, say we had more diffuse. So say we go back to our 18 week old Kelpie with the shifting lameness and more kind of um, pain in multiple areas. And on palpation, this dog had really, really sore muscles and our CK was 15,000. Um, what other clinical signs might we see in that dog? Uh, like myoglobin urea. Good. Yeah. Excellent. So we've got pain, but what about um, other gait abnormalities that we might see? It might be really stiff, short gait, head drooping. Good drooping. Yeah. So we start to get weakness as well with myositis, which we don't often get with skeletal changes. So that's a nice thing to sort of look out for. They kind of will walk for a while and then want to lie down, look a little bit myasthenia-y. Um, what about 
the other muscles that aren't skeletal that might be affected or that are they are actually skeletal mm -hmm. you mean like potentially an arrhythmia mm -hmm. good yeah any other regurgitation yes good why mega esophagus yes exactly good right so you see that you can see mega esophagus with an inflammatory myositis yeah right. and and my um cardio my what is that word Ositis. Ositis. <laughs> got my cardio and myos from around my way myocarditis <laughs> um, as josh said everything is so um inflammation can be specific for striated muscles, in which case we'll still get esophageal abnormalities, um, or um, can be quite generalised for other types of muscle as well, um, particularly if it's infectious. Infectious organisms don't necessarily differentiate between muscle types. They quite like just muscle in general. Um, what about, we've got regurgitation from megaesophagus. We also see dysphagia quite commonly and dysphonia quite commonly in myositis so it's a nice little historical tidbit to get out of the owners if their bark's changed or um if they seem to have trouble prehending or swallowing food um what sort of myositis what would cause myositis in such a young dog typically kind of covered it already infectious or autoimmune yeah yep yeah. um that's pretty much it and then the only other thing i'd put on the list not in this dog 18 week old in particular but perineoplastic potentially but um muscular dystrophy as well yes no? good yeah so let's talk about muscular dystrophy. Whoa. <laughs> it's a very big, like in humans, there are hundreds of muscular dystrophies, like subtypes of muscular dystrophy. What is a muscular dystrophy? It's, um. so I think it's a, it's got something to do with the, I think the muscle cell um, kind of sustaining itself. I think, mm -hmm. I think yep. it's muscle forms, like it's energy kind of sustenance. So they mm -hmm. kind of die basically and have to be kind of turned over multiple, mm -hmm. multiple times, far more often than other muscle cells. Yeah. In a normal dog. Yeah. And so there's all different causes of that. So it might be that there's like a um, abnormality in the way that the muscle cells join onto each other. So the strain on those muscles might mean that the muscle cells just pull apart. And so the animals just produce more and more muscles because they can't like they're um, mm. more and more muscle cells because they can't um, generate tension in those muscles. Yeah. So then we get weakness and stuff. We can have metabolic abnormalities, so where they can't utilize glycogen and they therefore don't have adequate energy sources once they run out of glucose that's been delivered fresh. Um, they might have um, mitochondrial abnormalities where they can't um, or can only do anaerobic metabolism or can't do anaerobic metabolism. Um, which is obviously very important in muscles because they rely on being able to work beyond the energy supply. Um, so all sorts of different um, causes of muscles to be abnormal. And as you can imagine, with all of those different subtypes of muscular dystrophy, the way that they progress, the rate that they progress, the level of CK elevation, the presentation can be so varied in like it might be a 10-year-old dog that comes into you or it might be an eight week old dog that comes into you. Um, Labradors, I think get all of the types of muscular dystrophies that are reported in dogs. So that's a breed that I'd have on my radar if they came in with a strange kind of weakness or gait abnormality or um, a confirmation 
even like the dogs can look quite abnormal uh, have you ever seen one anyone ever seen one seen, i've seen a dashend oh yeah what did he look like uh he had more atrophy in his muscles so he wasn't one of the yeah, the muscly ones yes. um, and um, his main kind of issues was, was any kind of increased activity he would have um, pigmenturia um, yeah. and the main reason I was seeing him was because of his he's having kind of recurrent um, like dysphagia and um, kind of regurgitation issues and he was often aspirating mm -hmm. um, which made it really complicated and he also had a GDB at one point and had to have a pexy and then he kind oh. of con continued to have um, uh, kind of ongoing bloat as well so it's an absolute disaster <laughs> but he was still alive now. he's still alive still alive and all of his little mates have died from um cardiac abnormalities and arrest wow so, yeah um that's a cool case it is a really cool case actually yeah mm. uh, i've seen a few labradors um with muscular dystrophy and i think probably the most the thing that's not really talked about in textbooks but the thing that makes me go ah oh, this is a muscular dystrophy is actually glossal thickening mm. So it's a really like you sort of do an oral exam and just go, that tongue looks like a slug, like it's really thick. Uh, and that's something that seems to be quite common but not talked about. So I don't know whether it's Australian populations, but talking to Georgina Child, I was like, oh, have you seen this? And she's like, yeah, that's it. That's what it is. Like mm. it's a muscle dystrophy. Um, so um, that's something just to keep an eye out for if you get a strange presentation. And a dog, like typically muscular, muscular dystrophy is not painful unless they've, exerted themselves and ended up with rhabdomyolysis and the ck if you've you're in that um kind of scenario will be over twenty thousand. um whereas the ck at rest in that dog might be 400 and just slightly elevated and not necessarily giving you any hints um or like major hints that there's an osseo dystrophy um so uh they can be really complicated to get to the bottom of and muscle biopsies, which we we often send them to the US to have them looked at because they've got special stains and can classify all of the different types and they've got knowledge of the human classifications and stuff um, is the only way to really diagnose them properly. Um, what about endocrine disorders which cause myopathies? Hi, Bray. Yes. For the, um, I don't know what the mechanism is but weakness and uh, myopathy yeah absolutely um so we're not only do we get loss of muscle um due to the catabolic effects of cortisol um we also get energy um changes which are irreversible with trivastain therapy in the muscle cells um and then we also get ligament injuries they're more susceptible to ligament injuries um, what other endocrinopathy? Hypothyroidism. Good. Yeah. Um, I can't remember what the mechanism is of that, but the hypothyroid dogs, you know, how if there's those dogs that you, they're hard to diagnose and like it's not a slam dunk on the blood tests and free T4 is a little bit low, TSH is normal, and you're like, oh, I'm not sure. If the CK is up and the cholesterol is up, I'm pretty sure it's hypothyroidism. Most hypothyroid dogs will have a mild elevation in CK and inability to get in and out of the car, but usually that's because they're so heavy. Um, we better wrap up there. Um, that wasn't as boring as I thought it was going to be. Thank you, everybody. <laughs> um, and I think we've moved on to comorbidities, and the next one we're talking about is diabetes and Cushing's together. Um, so bring cases, I reckon, um, and we'll try and kind of make it as clinically applicable as possible and talk about the intersections of the diseases as they come up. Hang on. I think we're off in a fortnight. Sorry, let me just double check. I'm going to just know. Yeah, okay. So next fortnight we're having a break. And then, so it's going to be in a month's time. Okay. Super. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Bye. Yeah, thank you Bye. so much. Have fun at snow. Thanks, Anna. Terrific. Which snow are you going to?
Falls Creek. Okay. Very right. exciting. Yeah. We'll, we'll be in Charlotte Pass next fall. Ah, uh, no, we are definitely going to keep on driving after that, after Charlotte Pass. Um, so nice down there, though. Yeah. Enjoy yourself, Jess. We'll see you. I think I'll see you today at Hornsby, yeah? Pardon? Are you at Hornsby Heights today? Uh, no, just Mondays and Tuesdays. Oh, right. I'm at Hornsby Heights today. Oh, right. Good. Yeah, they're nice there. <laughs> they're really nice. Um, all right, I better run. I'll see you soon. Thanks. Bye. Bye.